So Psalm chapter 90, we're going to be there this morning. Psalm chapter 90, and this is a psalm that Moses wrote. So this is the oldest psalm in the entire psalm book. Out of all 150 psalms, this is the oldest dated one that we know of. So follow me, Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Verse 3, you return man to dust and say, return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are, are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. It flourishes in the morning and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. Verse 7, for we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Now look at verse 11. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Psalm chapter 90. Dead Poet Society was a movie that exploded onto the scene in 1989. It's one of my favorite movies of all times. And I think, I think that it's hands down Robin Williams' finest work as an actor. <laughs> and that story in the movie revolves around this elite prep boarding school in the 1950s in the United States. It's a place where well-to-do families sent their sons to be trained in a prestigious career of engineer, medicine, law, business, um, all kinds of things like that, academics. And the very beginning of the movie, it opens up with an introduction to the newest member of the faculty, the, the new head of the English department, who specializes in poetry, and his name is Mr. Keating. And of course, that character is played very well by Robin Williams. Now, the first day of class, all of Mr. Keating's young, teenage, impressionable boys in his classroom, they know immediately that this is a, t a teacher who's very different from all the other staff. He's very different. He employs very unorthodox methods in order to help those young men grab hold of life by the horns and understand the fleeting nature of life. And they love him. They fall in love with him, and they're drinking up every word that he says. In fact, one of the most gripping scenes in the entire movie is the lesson that Mr. Keating delivers to these young boys on the very first day of class. He takes them out of the classroom, down the hall, down the stairs, into the lobby of this 100-year-old institution, and he positions all of them in front of these ancient trophy cases that has footballs and shiny trophies and pictures, photographs, old black and white photographs of all the other young men that have been through this school for decade after decade after decade. And Mr. Keating ha has them read some lines from ancient poetry. He, he reads these lines. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. He reads a line from that poem, and then he says, gentlemen, gentlemen, listen to me very carefully. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. That sentiment in Latin is called carpe diem, seize the day. Seize the day, carpe diem. And he says this, why does the writer use such urgent lines? And of course, all the young men are just drinking every word he says, and he says, because of this, 
We are all worm food lads. All of us are going to be worm food. It's really interesting. It's a really gripping part. And then he turns the boy's attention toward the trophy cases where all those photographs are. And he says this, believe it or not, boys, one of these days, each and every one of us in this group is going to turn cold and we're going to die and we're going to stop breathing. And he says, now look at these faces. Look at these faces from the past. You walk by them every day. And I think you'll find that they're not so very much unlike you. Their haircut's just like yours. The, ro- the world is their oyster. They think, that, they think that they're indestructible just like you feel. They have hopes and dreams and aspirations just like you have. Their eyes are full of hope. He says, but now they are fertilizing daffodils. But he says this. He says, but if you listen real close, and in a way only Robin Williams can do. He said, but if you listen real close, You can hear their legacy that they're passing on to you. Go ahead, boys. Lean in close. You remember this scene? And he begins to whisper. They're leaning in. They're looking at each other like, this is kind of weird. And they're looking at all the, it'd be like Cracker Barrel. All those old pictures of people that you know are dead now. And he says, lean in close, boys. Listen to them. And then Robin Williams says, carpe, carpe diem. Seize the day. Make your lives extraordinary, boys. And the rest of the movie is really, that's the thing that's set. This teacher, Mr. Keating, who employs all these unorthodox methods, unorthodox methods for helping these boys grab hold of the horns in life and make their life extraordinary, it's them being under his influence. And essentially, if you would ask, okay, yeah, I get it, carpe diem, man, our life is brief, it's a vapor, even the Bible says that. So how do we carpe diem? Well, Mr. Keating's method for carpe diem was to teach these boys to live their life by nobody else's terms but their own. That was his answer to the dilemma of of mortality, of man's mortality. And so the rest of the movie, that very thing you see played out in front of your eyes. And now listen, spoiler alert, it doesn't go well. It doesn't go well for anybody in that movie. In fact, there's tragic consequences. Tragic consequences. One young man gets expelled from the school for being mischievous and breaking the rules. Another young man falls in love with a girl who's basically engaged and is nearly beat within an inch of his life. And the greatest consequence in the movie is a a young man named Neil Anderson who's really felt inspired by Mr. Keating. You know what he does? He goes against his father's wishes, absolutely defies everything his father's told him, and he pursues his passion in an acting career. And his father finds out he's furious. He's furious. He shows up at the theater, takes his son home, withdraws him from the school, and that very night his son takes his own life, commits suicide. It's really tragic, really tragic. And Mr. Keating, beloved Mr. Keating, after a thorough investigation by the school, he's terminated, loses his job, no longer has any influence with those boys. And so you think, that's really interesting. You know, that movie sold a lot of tickets. We all paid money to go and see that. Why? Why is it? That when a movie like that comes out, so many people flock to hear it. Because listen, he's on to something there. He's on to something. He's right. Life is brief. Life is short. One day we will be worm food, won't we? One day we're going to be fertilizing daffodils. And the quicker that we understand that, the more of a lasting impact we're going to be able to have in life. But listen, while those people put their finger on on a serious problem, a serious condition of humanity... None of them holds forth the answer that we need. None of them. In fact, there's zero solution in that movie. If you went to that movie to find hope and the answer to that dilemma, you're not going to find it. You're not going to find it. In fact, Robin Williams and the producer and director of that movie, they're not the first people to ever put their finger on that gnawing problem that eats away at us when we lay our heads on our pillow at night. You can find this in any artistic expression, whether it's a movie, it's a poem, it's a book, music, now, I enjoy music. I like music. And I was looking at some of my favorite songs from the past, and I never really, you ever wonder, why do those songs resonate with me? And you start to read the lyrics, and you're like, wow, I was singing that in my car back in the 80s and 90s, not knowing that I'm, I'm singing my own fun, funeral dirge. I'm singing about a problem that I have, knowing no answer to it. Let me give you an illustration, okay? Here's an illustration. Dust in the Wind. You ever heard that song? A little band named Kansas from the 1970s. Nobody knew who they were. And then accidentally, really, it's interesting if you read the story, they penned this song. Um, I won't go into all the history of it, but 
the song explains itself, doesn't it? It became a golden hit that sold over a million copies. In 1978, that's quite an accomplishment. You think, man, this song may be, it must be awesome. Yeah, listen to the lyrics here. I close my eyes only for a moment, and the moment's gone. All my dreams pass before my eyes with curiosity. Dust in the wind. All they are is dust in the wind. Same old song. I'm so tempted to sing this. <laughs> Same old song. Okay, I'm not going to do it. Just a drop of water in an endless sea. All we do crumbles to the ground that we refuse to see. Dust in the wind. All we are is dust in the wind. Don't hang on, the author says. Nothing lasts forever but the earth and sky. It slips away and all your money won't another minute buy. Why did that song, why was that such a raging popular song? Because he hits on a theme that every human being has experienced that doesn't have his head in the sand. He's right. The language goes back to Genesis 3. We're dust. We are dust in the wind. And everything we do, all the hopes, the dreams, the accomplishments that we really want to grasp, they fall forgotten, don't they? For the most part, they fall forgotten. You say, okay, there's a movie and a song. Well, I'm not, I'm not finished yet. I really want to show you that culture understands what this psalm writes about, but culture doesn't have any answers. You have to go to Scripture for that. Really, what I'm, telling, I'm trying to prove to you this morning in this introduction is the Bible has answers for the questions that we're not even asking the right way. The Bible has answers. The Bible is so relevant to our lives today. So many people think, you know what, preacher? Tell me something that matters to me. Tell me something that actually helps me. I intend to do that because I don't think the Bible's boring. I don't think it's old or stale or indifferent or archaic. I think it speaks to the innermost needs that we have as fallen human beings made in God's image, fallen in Adam, and desperately needing to be restored and redeemed through Christ. Speaks and addresses all those needs. Listen to this song. Simon and Garfunkel, for some of you older folks out there. Who knows who that is? Paul Simon, not from the Beatles, but a different Paul Simon. Slip sliding away. God only knows. God makes his plan. The information's unavailable to the mortal man. We're working our jobs. We collect our pay, believe we're gliding down the highway when in fact we're slip sliding away. Let's try one more. Darius Rucker, Hootie and the Blowfish, 1995. A little blast from the past here. He wrote a song called Time. Time, why do you punish me? Like a wave bashing into the shore, you wash away my dreams. Time, why do you walk away? Like a friend with somewhere to go, you left me crying. Can you teach me about tomorrow and all the pain and sorrow running free? Because tomorrow's just another day, and I don't believe in time. That's it. You hear the problem? Time, you're punishing me. You're punishing me. And what's the answer? I don't believe in time. Well, Darius Rucker, I'm sorry. You may not believe in time, but it certainly believes in you, and I've seen you, and you're aging. It's working its magic on you, my friend. So you can put your finger on that problem, but the culture has no remedy for it, has no answer, has zero solution. But it is interesting that they know the problem, they acknowledge it. So you hear what all those artists are saying. We're slip sliding away, we're dust in the wind, we're fertilizing daffodils, time is punishing us. And you've got to hand it to them, they're right. Shocker, sometimes the culture is actually right. Did you know that? Again, they just don't have the answer. So... God does have the answer. He does have the answer. In fact, he's going to show us not just this shallow, trite, superficial, oh, time is so brief, and you know, we don't have very long in this world. No, you know what? There's actually a reason that time is so brief. There is a reason that we seem so empty and so shallow and so insignificant and so sad. There's actually a reason for that. And Moses actually goes underneath uh, the pile of manure that society and culture so often throws on top of that and gives you the real question you should ask, not why is time seem to be, uh, why uh, life is so short, but rather why is it so short? Why is it so sad? Why are we so empty? And then the most important part of the psalm is in what can be done about it? What can we do about it? Or do we need help from another? So that's what this psalm is about. How do you seize the day? If you, if you, the question I want to set up the outline is, okay, I get it, Robin Williams. Seize the day. What does that look like? How do we do that? Carpe diem. How do you do that? Not in any way like Robin Williams, Paul Simon, Kansas, or Darius Rucker says. By the way, you do want that for yourself, don't you? Don't you want your life to count? 
Don't you want to leave a lasting legacy for the people that come after you? Of course you do. God made you that way. You want your work to prosper. You want your work to endure. You want to leave a legacy. You're hardwired that way. But you're also, because of the fall, hell-bent, if I may say it that way, on doing it in a way outside of God's purpose and God's plan. So two points this morning. How do you carpe diem? How do you seize the day? Point number one, consider your mortality. Consider your mortality. Now, when you hear that word mortality, you're going to think of one thing probably, death. And that's good. That's right. You should. It does certainly mean that. We're mortals. That means we are finite and we are subject to time and subject to change and subject to the second law of thermodynamics and entropy and everything grows greater and greater and greater into disrepute and disrepair if left alone. That's what happened at the fall. That's what Adam and Eve, that's their legacy that they left to us. But don't only think of death, okay? Don't think of, I want you to think of more than death, but certainly not less. When I talk about mortality, I'm talking about everything that is entailed in the fall. So if, you, if you're wondering how I get that first point, consider your mortality. I'm getting it directly out of verse 12. Look at it with me. Verse 12, Moses says this, So teach us to number our days. I love the N-E-T, the net Bible's translation for that verse. It says this, teach us to consider our mortality. Teach us to consider our mortality. Now, that sounds at first like, why in the world would God want us to do that? I can't think of anything more sad and dejecting and morbid and depressing than that, considering our, our mortality. But beloved, listen, when God tells us to do something, it's not so he can be up in heaven and mocking us. Ha! Ha! I'm eternal from everlasting to everlasting. I'm God, and you are above of the dust. You're a bunch of maggots sub subject to time and change and decay and corruption and vice and pollution, and you're just going to evaporate. No, that's not God's purpose at all. When God tells us to do something like consider our mortality, he has a very good, righteous reason behind it because he's wanting to humble us and drive us to despair, which in turn will drive us up to him to seek answers and to seek help and to find it. So the first thing is consider your mortality. Now, this is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. That's the subtitle for the psalm. And Moses, this is really one of his memoirs. He is at the very end of his life. You know how long Moses lived to be? 120 years old. It's quite a life, isn't it? Quite a life. 120 years old. And Moses is at the end of his life. He is at the entrance to the land of Canaan, the promised land, and he's been through the wilderness wanderings for 40 years. And I want to tell you this, Moses, he is the leader of Israel. He's a premier leader, but he was no stranger to suffering and sadness. Moses saw a lot. He felt a lot. He experienced a lot. Moses saw death all around him, all around him. They had been subject to it for 40 years, 40 years. In fact, it's interesting. If you do the math over a million people left Egypt in the Exodus that we read about. Over a million people. Actually, if you do the real math, about 1,200 people Moses led through the wilderness. Only a handful actually entered the promised land. And everybody else, the Bible says, what happened to them? They died. They perished. They perished in the wilderness. And it's interesting, if you look at the geographic, geographical location, the wilderness, it's not this huge, massive place. It's actually very small. Part of their judgment for their unbelief is that they had to do tracks. They had to do circles in that wilderness. And can you imagine, within a 40-year time span, over a million people having died in that small location? You know what that would be like? That would be, somebody did the math and they said Moses probably conducted over 50, somewhere between 50 and 75 funerals every day. Every day. That's two to three people dying every hour. I mean, Moses had the funeral director's number on speed dial, didn't he? <laughs> In fact, if, 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 you, if you would say that this is a book that Moses wrote, it would start out this way, Charles Dickens style. It was the worst of times. It was the worst of times. There are no best of times here. This is very sad. He has been walking around in death, surrounded by death for the last 40 years. The only creatures that were happy were vultures. I mean, they were really happy. It was a really good time for them. Some people feed pigeons. Moses fed vultures with all the carcasses. And the Bible says in the New Testament, they were literally scattered. I don't even know if they were all properly buried. You, you may have just seen decomposing bodies. Sometimes a plague would come and wipe out thousands of people. Think of everything that Moses saw. And I promise you, we're going to go somewhere with this, okay? There's hope in this psalm, but you've got to face the misery first. You've got to face mortality. Moses is calling us to do that for a reason. Think of all the things that Moses saw. 
He saw his sister contract leprosy for her rebellion and unbelief. Moses saw his two nephews, Nadab and Abihu, struck dead by God's fire for offering profane, strange fire before the Lord. Moses saw an entire family named Korah. He saw the earth actually open up, earthquake style, and swallow up this entire family, the women, the children, husbands and wives, everybody. Moses saw that. Moses saw fiery, venomous serpents slither into the camp and start biting people because of their rebellion and unbelief. And we don't know how many died. The Bible doesn't say. And he had to erect a, a serpent on a pole for people to look up to, to be a foreshadowing of what Christ will do. Think of all the things that Moses saw. He saw plagues wipe out people. And listen, all of that because of their what? Unbelief. Because of their unbelief. So Moses is calling us to consider our mortality because he certainly did. This is his memoir. He saw a, level, a lot of trouble going down. He saw God's people were subject to famine. They were subject to diseases. They were subject to war, to attacks. This was a horrible time in the history of, of, of Israel. Bodies were probably decomposing. Flies were buzzing around. Moses saw a lot. In fact, this exodus, you read about it, God is doing one, accomplishing one of the greatest rescues in the history of Israel, and it turns into a 40-year trail of tears like nothing we've ever seen. Over a million people died circling around in the middle of the wilderness. I was talking to my son Jackson the other day, and I said, Jackson, how would you feel, son, if I told you, listen, we had tickets to the greatest theme parks in Orlando, Disney World, Universal, Legoland, Aquatica, SeaWorld, we'll go to all of those. So let's all get, and I put you in the car, and I started driving down I-4, and we got closer and closer, and you started complaining, and, and you didn't believe that we were going, and so I took you there, and we started circling the exit ramp again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and you could see the, th you could see the children enjoying the rides, but we never went there. Or worse, maybe we went there, we paid, we paid for the parking ticket, and then we sat in the parking lot for 40 years, and you never got out of the car. How would that make you feel, son? <laughs> his eyes got really big, and he said, I wouldn't like that at all, Daddy. I said, that's what God did to the people in the Old Testament because of their unbelief. It's a very serious thing to consider, isn't it? Very serious thing. So what am I saying? I'm saying this. This psalm describes for us a universal experience. This is not isolated to a period 4,000 years ago. It's not isolated to Israel. It's certainly not isolated to Moses. We face things like this all the time. In fact, look at this description in Psalm 90. Let's get into the text here. Look, starting in verse 3, listen to what it says. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with the flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. It's really interesting. In it, that language, we're dust, it says. That takes you back all the way to Genesis 3, the curse. From the dust you came and to the, to the dust you shall return. It says that we're like a watch in the night, which was three to four hours for a Jew. We're swept away like a flood or a dream that's just over in just a moment. We're like grass. It's interesting, the very first part of this psalm, he says, you are God from everlasting to everlasting. You're, before the mountains even came into existence. So when you think of God's eternality, just this massive thing that we can't wrap our minds around, he's forever existed. He's outside of the times and limita the limitation and, and constraints of time. And then we're like grass. So think of the most solid, enduring thing you can, this huge, enormous rock, like a mountain. And then think of us, we're like grass. Spurgeon said this, he said, we're like grass. We're sown, we're grown, we're blown, and then we're gone. <laughs> that's, that's our plight. That's our plight. And that's humbling to consider, isn't it? Isn't that humbling to consider that, how, how momentary and brief our lives really are? He's highlighting the brevity of our life. 70 years, or if by reason of strength, 80, and then your years are gone, you're finished. He even says, it's like at the very end, you fly away. You fly away. Have you ever had a bright bloom for one of your children on a windy day? And the sky is clear, and whoop, it slips out of their hand, and they start to cry, uncontrollably cry. And you turn, and you look at it, and you say, whoa, 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 just wait a minute. Let's just watch it and see where it goes. And if you take your eyes off of it for a minute, it's gone. It flies away. That's the description that Moses gives us here of our life. 
momentary, like a vapor, James says. It's gone. It flies away. Now listen, honestly, if we're really honest with ourselves, that's not an earth-shattering revelation, is it? I mean, you don't need a, a, a screaming preacher to st uh, stand up here and tell you that. You already knew that. You already knew that your life is fleeting and that you don't have very long to figure out what it is that you're supposed to be doing. You knew that, didn't you? Of course you did. But listen, beloved, what comes next in this psalm is very, very, very instructive for us. And it's critical that we understand this. It's critical for us. Why is life fleeting? Why are we so subject to mortality that Moses talks about here? And why is this life, listen, why is this life so punctuated with sadness and with death and with just brokenness? Why is that? The Bible has answers. The Bible asks the right questions. Listen, it's because of sin, it's because of rebellion, and it's because of our unbelief. That's the answer that the Bible gives us. The things that introduce us, those are the things, our sin, our rebellion, our unbelief, those are the things that expose us to God's wrath and his anger and his judgment. You're thinking, wait a minute, didn't you say this series was on comfort? Yes, it is. This series is on comfort, and we have to get to that comfort through this mortality path. We have to. You have to consider your mortality, or you'll never look for the right kind of comfort, beloved. You won't. And it's very interesting to me in Psalm chapter 90. Look at verse 7 here. For we are brought to an end by your what? By your anger. Now, you're not going to hear any of those things in a Dead Poet Society movie or a Hootie and the Blowfish song or Kansas or Simon and Garfunkel or anybody else unless you're listening to Stephen Curtis Chapman or somebody like that, okay? They're not going to really put their finger on the real dilemma that we have. It's not that our life is short. It's that it's punctuated by rebellion and by unbelief and by unfaithfulness to God. That's the reason that this veil of tears that we live in every day is the way that it is. I'll be really honest with you. The other day I was talking to one of my older children uh, who's kind of a skeptic. I have kids that they're, they tell you what's on their heart and sometimes it's unbelief, it's skepticism. And this, this child said, Daddy, how do we know that the Bible's really true? And I really wonder about the existence of God. And, you know, after I threw up in my mouth, um, no, I didn't. That, hey, does that shock you? Does that shock you that a fallen human being wonders about the existence of God and questions whether the Bible is true or not? That's, that shouldn't shock us. Uh, but it kind of caught me off guard. And I sat down and I said, listen, listen, honey, that's a really good question. And this house is a safe place to ask things like that. And, and here's my answer to that. I want you to consider what the Bible has to say about your life and your mortality and your existence and then weigh that against what every other resource in the world and every other piece of literature and every other religion tells you. And I think you're going to find um, that the Bible is the only book in the world that has the answers. In fact, it's the, only it's the only book in the world that explains why the world is in such horrible, chaotic, corrupt um, state that it's in. The Bible has the answers, friends. It does. The truth demands scrutiny. Ask, the Bible can take anything you level at it. And that's what, that's what Paul, excuse me, that's what Moses tells us here. It's not, it's not an earth-shattering revelation that uh, this is a veil of tears that we walk through. What's earth-shattering is the reason why, that we have to consider. Why is it? We've gone our own way. We have rebelled against our maker. We've shaken our fist at our creator. And we've done what Robin Williams said. Listen, living life on nobody's terms but your own, I'm sorry. That's not the answer to the dilemma. That's what got us in that dilemma. Living life on nobody's terms but your own, that's why this life is so punctuated by rebellion and unbelief and death and sadness. That's not the answer. That's the problem. And God shows us a lot of things, doesn't he? Does, does God not show us everyday pain and heartache and poverty and profound brokenness? Listen, you don't have to drive very far down the road before you're going to encounter a profound reminder of our brokenness. An ambulance will pass you with their lights on, or you'll pass a correctional facility, or you'll be driving down the highway and, and, and you'll see a pantry closet or a halfway house, or you'll see a drug deal going down on the corner. It doesn't take very long. Or you'll see a man holding up a sign, anything helps, God bless, and you'll see an empty array of alcoholic containers and maybe some children at his feet, and you realize this is a broken world that we live in. It's broken. It's a wreck. Listen, this life has fallen we're broken. Our bodies are broken. Our world is broken. 
Our marriages, some of them are broken. Our churches are broken. Our homes are broken. Don't ignore those things. God doesn't want you to turn a blind eye to those things. He doesn't. He wants them to serve as gracious reminders to us that we need his help. That we need his help. In fact, I'll say it this way. The wisest man who ever lived apart from Jesus Christ said this. He said this. He said, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2. Solomon said that. He said this. For that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. When you consider your mortality, you're going to take it to heart. You're going to take it to heart that this life is brief. This life is empty. And a lot of people, like the, the old poet said, they live lives of quiet desperation. And the whole earth groans, Romans 8 says. Listen to it. Listen to it. Don't stop your ears. The earth is groaning for its redemption, and we should groan too. That's what this psalm is really about. We're surrounded by death and sorrow. In fact, just last week, it hit really close to home. In the Deltona Middle School, there was a teacher, and she was entrusted with the, the care of a six-month-old little baby um, boy named Trevor Collins, I think. And listen, I'm not up here to judge her. I'm not, because I know how easy it is to forget about a baby being in the back seat of your car. It can happen in an instant. It's almost happened to us before. And this, I don't think this was her baby. This was a relative of hers that had been entrusted to her. And she went through her routine that she did every morning. And she went to the middle school and she parked her car and she went in and totally forgot about that six-month-old baby. And eight hours, eight hours, excuse me, eight hours later, <clears throat> they found that baby in the car and they couldn't revive her, couldn't revive him. And then just last Wednesday, there was, a, there was a young lady, and she was seen going into Lowe's, and she came out of Lowe's, and she disappeared. Nobody could find her. Her mom couldn't find her. Her sister couldn't find her. They looked on the security cameras just down this road, just Hallam Boulevard, the Lowe's. She came out of that Lowe's. That's the last time anybody saw her alive on Wednesday night, and they found her yesterday morning floating in a lake. A fisherman found her. Listen, you don't have to go very far to just be reminded of how sad and how how mortal we are and how desperate we are. And Ecclesiastes 7, 14 says this, In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider, has God not made the one as well as the other? So that's really what the beginning of this psalm is. And enough of that. Let's move on, okay? Let's move on to the hope. This psalm actually offers hope to us. You have to go through, you have to consider your mortality first. You have to know that life is short, life is empty. It's because of our unbelief, it's because of our sin, it's because we have lived on our terms. All of us, the Bible says, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. We have all known that we've been created for God's glory, but we have shaken our fist in the face of God and said, I will live on my terms, I will live for my glory. That's why Romans 3 says, um, for all have fallen short of the glory of God, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means this. God created us, put us on this planet to live to bring him glory. So if you could say, here's my life and there's the target of God's glory right up there. And I'm supposed to be aimed at that. We've done this. We've turned around and gone our own way. And that has subjected us to, to God's wrath. So what's the answer to all of this? Is there an answer? What does the world tell you the answer is? Just grab life by the horns, just carpe diet, live it up? You know, there is a sinister website called Ashley Madison. Have you guys heard about this? And they started out, they wanted to provide services for people that were just maybe facing a midlife crisis and wanted to feel alive again. And so they offer this quote-unquote anonymous way for people that are in a covenant relationship with a spouse to have an affair. And in fact, the 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 heading on the website, I've never been to it, I've just read this because so many scandals have came out of this. The heading on the front of the website says this, life is short, have an affair. I mean, that's the answer that the world gives. Life is short, life is brief, live it up, feel alive again, do whatever it is to make you feel alive. And this is really interesting to me. Here's Moses, he's 120 years old, he's facing the final chapters of his life, he knows that he has been in the midst of death and suffering and sadness he has seen corruption, he's seen rebellion, he's seen it all. What does Moses say? Does Moses have this radical bucket list, you know? Moses says, Lord, I know that my life is short. Um, teach me to consider my, my mortality so that 
uh, I can climb the wall of China, that I can swim with sharks, so that I can coach a little league, so I can walk the great wall of China. He doesn't say anything like that, does he? I mean, that's what the world says, seriously. Your life is so short, so either do something really foolish or do something really carnal to make you feel alive again. Do you realize that's what a midlife crisis is? I'm 40 years old. That's when most people face this. Not everyone faces it, but some people do. And that's when you come to the middle of your life and you begin to sense, oh my goodness, <laughs> I have lived over half my life and I haven't done any of the things that I really wanted to do. I'm sensing just this emptiness, this hollowness, this shallowness to my existence. And you know what most people do? They panic. They absolutely freak out and they get on crazy train and they do something really stupid. Now, some of the things they do are harmless, okay? They think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suck the marrow out of life. I'm going to go buy a little red Corvette or, you know, dye my hair <laughs> or get some nips and tucks. Hey, listen, the Bible doesn't say anything against some of those things. In fact, if I show up one day and I have a full head of hair, don't ask any questions, okay? <laughs> And then there's some things that are just tragic. Life is short, have an affair. Are you tired of your wife? Are you tired of your husband? Trade them in, get another one. You tired of these kids? Trade them in for, the, for some others. Hey, I could tell you some tragic stories about people who have adopted. There's, some, there's a lot of tragedy in this world because people face this crisis of what Moses is talking about. And they have no discernible, clear solution at all, none. And so they, they, do, they go and they do something really carnal or really foolish or really sinful, really tragic. And there's a lot of collateral damage. A lot of people get hurt. A lot of pastors do those kinds of things. You know how many people signed up for the Ashley Madison website? 30 million people. 30 million people. And they're still counting, they're still counting the casualties from evangelicals. A lot of pastors that got caught. A lot of celebrities that profess to be Christian got caught on that side. And it's tragic. So listen, what's the answer to of life. What's the answer that Moses holds out? Listen to this. This is so awesome. Now, there's 17 verses in this. We can't get to all of them, but here's what Moses says. Look at verse Look at verse 10. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. And by the way, yet their span is but toil and trouble. It's interesting there. In Hebrew, it reads like this. The best Parts of our life are filled with destruction and, wicked, and wickedness. Isn't that interesting? Moses says, okay, you think, well, he's an old man. He's 120. Yeah, he's freaking out. No, Moses is looking back and he's saying even the best moments of our life were punctuated with sadness and with unbelief and with sin. And that's the truth. If you think about it, if you think about it, I know we think, oh, I like the good old days. Even the good old days had moments and seasons of profound brokenness in them. Everyone in this room can think of that if you look back. But he says this, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? Ah, now we're, now we're into something interesting here. This is really interesting. And I have to tell you this, I have to tell you this, in the New Testament in John chapter 5, Jesus was talking to the Jews that were very antagonistic to him. And he said this, he said, if you believed Moses, you would believe in me because he wrote about me. And I don't think that that's just talking about the first five books of the Bible. I think there is a whole lot of Jesus in, in Psalm 90. I think there's a whole lot of gospel in Psalm 90. And this is, <laughs> this is unbelievably encouraging. And I, and I pray that God helps us wrap our mind around this. You know what Moses is saying here? He says in, 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 in verse 11, Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? In Hebrew, it literally says this, Who really knows the full intensity of your anger, God? And he's saying two things there. He's saying, we haven't even seen the half of God's wrath and his fury. And he's also saying, and what's the answer to this? What's the answer to God's anger and his wrath and his fury being poured out on us? Nobody even knows the full extent of it. Ah, but somebody does. There is one who knows the full strength of God's fury and his anger. There is one. And his name is Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that on that cross, he felt and absorbed and experienced the full wrath of God's anger, the lightning bolt of God's anger fully struck Christ. I mean, if you think about it, the people in the wilderness, they probably felt abandoned by God, even though the Bible says they weren't really abandoned. He followed them, a, a cloud of pillar in the daytime for shade and protection, and a pillar of fire by night to give them light and comfort. But do you know Jesus Christ on the cross, he fully 
and completely experienced the total abandonment of his father. Complete desertion. Complete desertion. It's as if God turned around, saw Jesus hanging up on a cursed piece of wood, turned around, turned his back away and walked away. And that, cry, and that caused Jesus to cry out this blood-curdling cry that no theologic, theologian could fully fathom. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, if you read this psalm, you're like, yeah, I get it. We're living under the curse. We're all fighting the curse. We fight it every day. We go to the gym. We're fighting the curse. You know what? We're losing. In the end, the dirt wins. The dirt wins. So what's the answer? We can't beat the curse. We can't fight the curse. So what are we to do? You're to look to the one that did beat the curse. On that cross, the full wrath of God was pulled out. You know what a curse is? Do you know what it means, dear friends, to be cursed by God? It means that all of creation stands up and applauds your condemnation. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ took for you and I. You know what we need? You read this psalm and you consider your mortality. You know what you know you need? You need a substitute. Yeah, we went through the wilderness and we all disobeyed. We were unfaithful. We were perpetually unbelieving in your promises. Oh, that somebody would believe your promises and that somebody would take our place because we didn't. And they did. Listen, Jesus, it's interesting. It's interesting to me. When you read that account of the wilderness wanderings, do you know what it actually is? That was a sentence that God enacted on Israel, and he said, because of your unbelief, I sent the 12 spies into the promised land to spy it out for 40 days. They came back. They didn't believe. Because of that, your sentence, the gavel pounds on the, on the top of the wood. He says, you are sentenced to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, one year for every day. Now listen, Jesus Christ came, Matthew chapter 4. Where did he go? Where did the Spirit lead Jesus? Into the what? Wilderness. For 40 days, and for 40 days, he withstood all the temptations that the enemy could level at him. Every one of them. Every one of them. And at the end of that temptation, what did God the Father say? With a booming voice from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Wouldn't you love, wouldn't you love to hear that said about you? It has been. That's what the cross does. Think about that. It's as if God the Father himself looked at your life and made this declaration, this infallible, this infallible declaration, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased because of what Jesus did, not because of anything you did. There's nothing you could ever do to earn that kind of declaration. Jesus earned it all for you. Who has fully understood the power of your wrath? Jesus has. Who could possibly do something about it? Jesus has for you, and he offers you that life. You have to consider your mortality or you'll never need how, you'll never know how desperately you need Jesus Christ. Now, I've got one more point to make. Look at this. This is so good, guys. This psalm is so rich and it's so deep. And, and, and as a preacher, you stand up here and you tremble. You think, God, who's sufficient for these things? Look at this. Look at verse, look at verse 12. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. If you're a parent and you have a child and that child doesn't have very much money, but you do, and you really want that child to realize how much they need you, what do you tell them to do? Son, you want to buy that bicycle? <laughs> count your money. Go ahead. Count it. What do you got there? Well, I got, I got a quarter and a dime and a nickel. I got 78 cents or whatever that adds up to. You say, wow, you're, you want that bike and that's all the money you have? You really need help, don't you? Do you, do you tell them to count that to tease them? No. No, why do you tell them to count their money? Why do you tell them to consider their mortality? Because they need the one who is immortal, right? We're all bet. You know, the book of Psalms is a beggar's manual. It really is. Derek Kidner famously said this once about the book of Proverbs. He says, Proverbs is truth in street clothes. You know what the book of Psalms is? The book of Psalms is truth in hospital clothes. And I don't mean... <laughs> I don't mean the uh, scrubs with the stethoscope. I'm talking about the gown. <laughs> that humiliating thing that never quite covers the back of you, that's the book of Psalms. We're in a hospital gown. We're beggars. We're sick. We're in the ER, and we're crying out to God for help. And listen, you're going to see this the next four weeks. God gets so much glory and worship when you call out to him for help. He does. We had forgotten. Jeff used to say this. It takes Christ to live the Christian life, and when you call out to God for help, he's glorified. You call out for help, he gives it to you, he's honored, that's worship. That's worship. That's the story of the Old Testament, right, Jeff? I've fallen and I can't get up. That's the story of the Old Testament, and God says, I thought you'd never say that. Here, and he reaches down into your pit of sin and despair and rebellion and unbelief. Look at verse, look at verse 13. Teach us the number of our days, verse 12 says, so that we may get a heart of wisdom. 
What does a heart of wisdom? It actually says in Hebrew, so that we may bring to you a heart of wisdom. So consider your mortality, how brief, how empty, how shallow, how transient your life is, so that you may bring to heart, so that you may bring to God a heart of wisdom. What does a heart of wisdom do? Well, look at this. Look at, listen to this, uh, all these things that Moses requests. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Feel sorry for us because of this death and this judgment and this sin. And we're helpless and we're hopeless. You've seen the law, God. You gave it to us. We're crushed under the weight of it. We can't keep that. And then look what he says. Oh, this is so good, guys. Verse 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Satisfy us in the morning. You know what Moses prays here? He doesn't pray... Carpe diem, consider your mortality, and then go do and, and go and do a bunch of stuff to try and feel alive again. And try to ignore this, this, this pervasive problem that we have. We know our lives are brief. We know we're going to face judgment at the end. That's not what Moses says to do. You know what he does? He asks God to do something for him. This is so rich. He says, Satisfy me with your steadfast love in the morning so that I may be glad and rejoice all my days long. Now, listen to me. This is very important. Satisfy me, in Hebrew, is a word, and it literally means to fill somebody up to overflowing. This is dining language, okay? This is, this is language used in the Old Testament of a baby when it was full of milk and burping and throwing up all over you, you know, when you burped the baby. This is language even used when God filled up the Israelites with manna from heaven, and then he gave them quail, and it was coming out of their nose. They were filled up to overfull stuffed. Have you ever been so full and so rich, so overflowing, you ate a steak, a 16-ounce steak, and then somebody would say, hey, you want a bowl of cereal? And you're like, oh, goodness, I'm going to throw up in your face. That's the kind of language that is used here. He says, God, fill me up, and this is the best part of this. This is the best part of this entire psalm. Fill me up with your steadfast love. And that word for steadfast love, beloved, is the word hesed. And it's the Old Testament word for grace and gospel. Grace and gospel. Now, does that sound counterintuitive? Consider your mortality. Teach us to number your days so that I may uh, present to you a heart of wisdom. And then you ask God. The answer to all of this is, is this request. Lord, fill me up to overflowing with your covenantal, unfailing, never-ending love that's unconditional, it's unearned, it's unmerited, and I can never lose it. Fill me up with that so that I'll be glad the rest of my life. That's the answer. That is the answer. Fill me up. And listen, that even points you to the New Testament, to places like Colossians 2.10, where it says, and we are made complete in him. That is Christ. And that word made complete is plerao. It's a word that means filled up. We are filled up in Christ. This is an Old Testament version of the gospel. It really is. And this takes you all the way back to Genesis 15. Am I, am I making sense? <laughs> I hope I'm making sense. Genesis 15, okay? That is the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant that God made with Abraham. And in the Old Testament, you didn't sign a covenant. Like when you buy a house or you buy a car and you sign 15 million pieces of paper and your hand is paralyzed for a couple of days, you didn't do that in the Old Testament. You know why you have to do that today? Because people don't keep their word. <laughs> You know that? You have to subject yourself to the strictest forms of litigation and accountability. You know what you did in the Old Testament? This is what they did in the Old Testament. When you made a covenant with somebody, you brought a bunch of animals, a heifer, a goat, a male sheep, a, pig, a, a turtle dove, a ram, and you would literally cut those animals in half and slaughter them and separate the pieces. This is, this is really interesting. Listen to this. You would slaughter it. Blood would be everywhere. And the person that you were entering into a covenant with, one would be on that side, the other would be on this side. And both of you would walk through those bloody slaughtered pieces of animals, and you would shake hands, swap spit, slap each other with your sandal, do whatever it was they did in the Old Testament. And this is essentially what you were saying. I make this covenant on pains of death. May I be cursed and may I be destroyed just like these animals if I ever violate the terms and the conditions of this covenant. That was the way you cut. It's berit. You cut a covenant in the Old Testament. Now, this language is, is the explanation for what that covenant was that God made with Abraham. Has said, covenant love. And listen to this. In Genesis 15, when God made a covenant with Abraham... Um, he didn't pass through the pieces of the animal and meet Abraham in the middle. Do you remember that story? In fact, this is really interesting. This is really interesting. 
He had just spoken with Abraham before that. And Abraham said, how will I know that you'll keep your promises to me, God? And and really what Abraham is asking is, how will I know that I'll, I'll live up to my end of the bargain? Because God's trustworthy. He's faithful. We're not. Abraham knew that. God made a covenant with Abraham. Abraham's really worried. God, how can I ever hope to keep my terms of the covenant? You know what God did? He put Abraham into a deep sleep and had all these animals slaughtered. This is so good, guys. This is so rich. And it says God walked through the pieces of animal and there was a smoking torch. And you know what? God walked through by himself. Because nobody can, meet the, nobody can meet the conditions of the covenant that God made except God himself. So God made a covenant with himself to pledge his steadfast, never-ending, irrefutable covenant faithfulness and love to Abraham. Because he knew Abraham couldn't keep up his end of the bargain. And that, my friends, is the gospel in the Old Testament. And that's exactly what this word signifies that Moses uses. And Moses says, God... This hellish life, I can't handle it. I have no answer. I had no solution. So please, God, fill me up with your steadfast covenantal love, and that will be enough for me. And the, and the rest of my life, I know that I'll live in gratitude to you, and it'll be a productive life. It'll be a fruitful life. I'll live a life of legacy. And listen, it goes on and on, and it says it's not only going to be productive in my life, but for my children and my children's children. I'm going over my time here. I'm going to have to stop. I wish that we could spend more time talking about this psalm. That's, that's just the, uh, the silver lining on the edges of all the beauty that you can find here. Listen, friends. Carpe diem, seize the day. That doesn't mean go out and, and do something carnal or do something foolish. It means to realize this, that we are all subject to God's wrath because of our sin. But listen, God is so kind. God is so loving. God is so compassionate and caring. He sent his only son to do what we could never do, to obey the law perfectly. And to take our place. We, desi- we deserve to be punished because we've broken, we've broken all the stipulations of any covenant uh, from the, at least the Mount Sinai, haven't we? And we're subject to God's wrath. But he kept that covenant for us completely. And he offers it to us by faith in Christ. The one who took the curse, died on the cross, and now offers his, us his perfect life. What a precious promise. And that's why there's so much comfort embedded in this psalm. That's what Moses talks about. 